student sample remained in the evidence processing room during the entire subsequent PCR process. Okay. That Mr. Yamauchi then sampled the Fitzco cart, which had by now dried. Okay. And that each with each sampling, Mr. Yamauchi placed the sampling in a separate micro centrifuge tube. What's your objection? My objection now is that the hypothetical has gone from assuming something generally to asking him to assume that Mr. Yamauchi in particular did certain things in certain ways. And I think that that's. Okay, that, that with each sampling, Mr. Yamauchi put the sampling in a, a micro centrifuge tube and capped it immediately. Okay, as each one is being processed. As, as each respective sampling was done. Okay. That he never had more than one micro centrifuge tube open at a time during this sampling process. Yes, that's important. Okay. Based on all the information that I've asked you to assume, can you comment on the likelihood that there was any sample to sample cross contamination if Mr. Yamauchi used those safeguards? I think it would be extremely unlikely that any cross contamination would occur. And then I think looking at the, the, the key also is to look at any of the results. And if, if those are negative, then they verify that. Okay, and let's, I want you to assume then that all the substrate controls tested negatively and add that to the hypothetical. What would that contribute to your opinion on that subject? Would that include any reagent blanks in that? Yes, the reagent blanks, all of the negative controls in the PCR processing. Yes, that would contribute to that opinion. Okay. Now, what's the significance of Mr. Yamauchi never having more than one microcentrifuge tube open at a time? Is there any significance if you accept the hypothetical about uh, Mr. Yamauchi never having one tube open at a time? What's the significance of that? Same objection. Rephrase the question. Is it significant that Mr. Yamauchi never had Rephrase more than one? What's the significance of not having more than one microcentrifuge open at a time? Microcentrifuge two open at the same time during the course of PCR testing. Yes, by, by following that procedure, that makes it such that one tube is not likely to contaminate the contents of another tube. In other words, if you open a tube and you have another tube open, then potentially these things we've talked about, such as aerosol, could occur. But by keeping it one tube at a time, you're, you're not going to see that problem, and you're also less likely to cross-contaminate and mix up samples. When, when you say you're not likely, is there any scientific data to support the idea that these amplicons can go through the walls of these tubes? I, I've never seen anything like that, no. Is that why those tubes are made of whatever they're made of? Well, that's why they're made that way, and also they have secure caps on them. Okay. It, what is the significance of only working on one coin envelope containing a substrate control bindle and a stain bindle at a time? At this point, asked and answered. He's asked the hypothetical. Now he's going back through each detail of the hypothetical again. And it seems to me that that's cumulative, repetitive, um, and we did it the last time. Well, the, the significance of that is that there's less likelihood of any mix-up and also there's less likelihood of any cross-contamination because if the sample is all closed up, it will not be contaminated by an open sample. Because it can't get out? Because it can't get out, basically. It's enclosed. Okay. Uh, and the last specific question on, on this series, what is the significance of, you remember I asked you to assume that Mr. Yamauchi only cut a portion of one of multiple swatches that then went off to the PCR process. What's the significance of holding back all those other swatches, particularly if they're sent to other laboratories to do testing? Well. The, the significance of that would be that as when 
that part of the examination, that initial part of the examination is done cleanly, then that can also be checked by having other laboratories run those particular remaining samples. Uh, what, what, you, what you gather from that is that if, if one were to make the hypothesis that there was some contamination, one would expect that this would be a, at best maybe some sporadic contamination. In other words, it's unlikely that all these swatches would all get this bit of contamination. So by having these swatches in reserve, one can check those against the other results. And I want you to assume hypothetically that um, with respect to Bundy items 47, these are along the walkway, 48, 50, and 52, based on what I've just represented in the hypothetical that portions of those swatches were processed by Mr. Yamauchi starting in serology and then in the way they do it, um, and that the balance of those swatches were sent to your laboratory or Cellmark. Okay. Okay. Let's assume that. What would be the significance of the three laboratories producing the ex exact same DQ alpha typing result? I say three labs, I mean Mr. Yamauchi, LAPD, Cellmark, and DOJ. Okay. Mr. Sims, um, let's go back to he's cut a portion of the swatch and then portions of those. Counsel, you can ask him the general question about the significance of other labs testing the same samples. But we do have the problem of overlap between the witnesses. Proceed. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. We have the problem between the overlap of the witnesses. Okay, I assume hypothetically that portions were processed by Mr. Yamauchi and by Selmark and DOJ. Counsel, what's your approach without the court reporter, please? Thank you, Council. Proceed. Let's try to get this. Mr. Sims, what's the significance if samples are sent to different labs of, of each laboratory getting the same test result? Well, again, by, by having these multiple swatches and by having different laboratories get the same results, that indicates to me that these are, in fact, valid results, that there's no evidence at all that contamination occurred. Okay. Are, are you familiar with the concept of handling or, or strike that? Um, are you familiar with the term of handling a sample downstream in terms of processing things in the PCR process? Yes, I, I know what that term means. Could you describe that for the jury, please? By processing samples downstream, and I, I'm working from my left to my right, uh, what I would normally do would be to start with the evidence samples on my left, have those tubes in a rack on my left, and then move in this direction of work so that, for example, the reference samples would be, and reference samples would be like victim and suspect samples, that sort of sample. Those would be downstream in the direction that I'm working. So these would be to my right as I'm working. Why would you do that? Well, the concern would be that if you were to have any sort of cross-contamination, you wouldn't want the reference samples to cross-contaminate the evidence. Uh, particularly in a, in a typical case, you're worried about the suspect sample cross-contaminating the evidence samples, for example, in a rape case or something like that. And so why is processing it downstream a solution to addressing that problem? 
Well, because, again, this goes to having one tube open at a time and, and working in a certain order that, that makes it unlikely that any possibility would exist whereby the suspect sample could come back this way into the evidence samples. Because you've processed it at a later time. Yes, you processed it at a later time downstream. And are you familiar with the Amplotype user guide? Yes. Okay. Uh, may, I, may I have a moment? Uh, Certainly. Mr. Sims, uh, uh, just to revert back for a second, if Mr. Yamauchi consumed all his samples in testing, okay, assume that all of his samplings in testing. Uh, I would. Mr. Sims, this, this PCR process, the way you do it, is it consumptive testing? Well, one of the advantages of PCR is that you don't have to use up all the sample if that's what you mean. In other words, you don't, you, you can get by with using very little material and still get a result, and that saves some material. It conserves evidence. Okay, but what you test, you consume? Yes, what you extract, you, you consume, except for the portion of the extract that you didn't use for the typing, for example. So, and just to revert back to my hypothetical, uh, assume that early on, cuttings were made and tested and consumed. Okay. Yes. And then you later got samples. Yes, now I, under I understand what your, your question is. In other words, those samples, those portions of fabric that have been extracted are no longer useful to us. We would need new portions, unextracted portions of fabric. And, and, that's, and you tested different swatches? Yes, I, I tested different physical pieces of cloth than the ones that Mr. Yamauchi tested. Okay. Mr. Sims, we, quite some time ago, we saw a defense exhibit that attempted, to, through a series of hypotheticals and assumptions that you addressed, to quantify amounts of DNA that was present in 47, 48, 49, 50, and 52. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Um, and you yourself processed item 117, which was collected from the rear gate at Bundy on July 3rd. Is that true? Yes, I did. Uh, what is the significance of comparing, to you as a scientist, of comparing how much high molecular weight human DNA is left in the Bundy stains to how much DNA is in item 117 that was collected uh, on July 3rd from the rear gate at Bundy? Objection. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a particularly significant comparison because the Bundy samples were clearly uh, the the ones that uh, included 47, 48, 49, and 50 were clearly degraded. So a lot of the human DNA would appear to have been degraded in those samples. Okay, and we'll talk details in a few minutes, but it, is there anything about the comparison of items 47, 48, 49, 50, and 52 with 117 in terms of how much DNA there that suggests scientifically that item 117 was not on that gate on June 13th. Objection to the form of that question. Stay with the question. Is there anything about the comparison or the attempt? I, I'll withdraw that. What, if anything, is there 
about Mr. Sheck's hypotheticals, which you were directed to assume numerous things, about the amount of DNA, human DNA, that was in 47, 48, 49, 50, and 52, when compared with 117, that relates to whether or not 117 was actually on that rear gate on June 13th. Sustained. Is there anything about the amounts of DNA that were contained in those items, 47, 48, 49, 50, 52, when compared with 117, that provides any scientific information about whether or not 117 was on that rear gate on June 13th? Same objection. Sustained. You can ask whether or not there's any relationship to their relative age. Is there anything about the amounts of DNA that were contained in those items that I keep numbering to you uh, that suggests how long any of those items were at Bundy, 49, 47, 48, 50, 52, when compared with 117? No, I, I, again, I don't think it's the, the amounts of DNA that are significant. I think the significance is probably in the collection, uh, the, the drying process. Okay. Let, let's talk about 115, 116, and 117. You've had a chance to examine and process 115 and 116 as well, have you not? Yes, I did. I processed those three samples from the rear gate. And have you seen photographs of them? Yes, I have seen some photographs. Well, let's take them one at a time. What is there, your observation of the photographs and of 115 and your examination of 115 that might shed some light on how long these things were there? Uh, that calls for speculation. Oh. Well, my understanding is that it's number 115 that is clearly shown in the uh, photographs from June and that I used that stain then as a basis to compare it to what I saw in my yields of 115, 116, and 117. Okay, would you describe what you saw there? As far as my yields? Yes, for those three items from the rear gate. Yes, what, what I calculated is I, I went back and looked at how much DNA I was getting per each weight of the swatch. In other words, remember we talked about weighing these swatches. And so I looked at the nanograms of DNA that I recovered per each milligram of the, each of the swatches that were tested. And the, the data that I came up with from that was, and this is for number 115, 116, and 117, uh, looking at the high molecular weight DNA on a yield gel, number 115 was 13.5 nanograms per milligram swatch. Number 116 was 13.6 nanograms per one milligram swatch, and number 117 was about 27 nanograms per one milligram swatch. So, how can you correlate the relative amounts then of those three stains to one another? Well, I'd say they're all in the same ballpark. Now, in, in uh, visualizing or seeing the photographs of 115 and 116, what did they look like as they appeared in the photograph that was taken of them uh, that you saw? Now, this would be 115 and 116? Just 115 and 116. Well, if, could, I, could I have that particular photo again just to refresh my memory on that? I'm not sure. We, Make, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to that. Okay. Okay. Um, now, you've also uh, had an opportunity through the hypothetical and, th and through reviewing records to have looked at how much DNA was in item 6 that was over at the Rockingham address, have you not? Yes, I did. And item 52, the, the stain that was processed for RFLP typing that showed a match with Mr. Simpson by Selmark. Yes. Okay. And what can you say about the relative amounts of DNA 
in 6, in 52, in 115, and 116. Well, it, it's, it's difficult to compare all those, but what I did is I looked at number 6, again with this nanograms of DNA per 1 milligram swatch, because that was a relatively undegraded sample. And I compared that to, for example, number 52 and some of the other Bundy drops as well. And the calculation that I came up with for number six, which was the Rockingham drop, was about 6.7 nanograms DNA per one milligram swatch. Uh, number 52 was about 2.4 nanograms DNA per one milligram swatch. And then the other samples, 47, 48, 49, and 50, that ratio was all, all those samples, the ratio was less than one. So those were the very degraded samples, 47, 48, 49, and 50. Okay, could we, uh, I'm sorry to do this belatedly, but could we write the relative amounts in uh, 287 for identification, Your Honor? How about if over the lunch hour we have Mr. Sims write that okay. out? And that, that'd be... Yeah. Now, did you also make a comparison, I think you just alluded, alluded to the, the sample, between how, the kind of DNA that you saw in item number six from Rockingham and the kind of DNA that you saw in item 48 along the Bundy walkway? Yes, I did. What can you tell us about that? Well, the, I can tell you that there was what I felt was significantly less DNA in that 48, that Bundy drop, than in the Rockingham drop. How do you know that? Just by doing this type of comparison and also by looking at the, the yield gel determination to show that there was a degradation present in that number 40, 48 sample, the Bundy drop. I mean, this was a degraded sample. And how do you know 48 was degraded? Well, I could, I could see evidence that there was some a bacterial growth on it, for example, that there was high molecular weight DNA of non-human origin, which suggested to me that it was probably bacterial. Now, let's throw in another stain, if you will, item number 12. Are you familiar with Cellmark's processing of uh, item number 12 from inside Mr. Simpson's residence? Yes, my understanding is that there was a significant amount of high molecular weight human DNA that enabled them to get an RFLP determination from it. And have you reviewed those records, too, to see the kinds of DNA that was present there? Yes, I believe we did that particular sample uh, very early on in our uh, work up on this case. Uh, and you reviewed actually some of Selmark's reports on that? Yes, I'd, I'd like a moment to check that sure. because this was, this was, I believe, back in August. Mr. Sheck, do you want to see what report he's looking at? Yes, I, this was on page four of my notes from August 13th. I noted that there was high molecular weight DNA in, in Cellmark sample 08, which was LAPD number 12. Any signs of degradation? Uh, I didn't note any for that sample. I did note some de degradations in some of the other samples. Okay, a any indicators of bacteria? Uh, Again, I, I don't recall seeing that in that particular sample, but I, I just looked for the high molecular weight band. That's, that's all the information I have. Okay, so. So far, we've discussed 115, 116, 117, 6, 52, 48, 
and 12. Yes. Um, just generally speaking, I, I, I don't want to belabor this point. Um, what is the impact of bacteria when it's comes in contact with a fresh blood stain? Well, the blood stain provides a nutrients for the bacteria to grow. So what the bacteria basically feed on that, and then they they thrive at the expense of the blood stain is what happens. And that's why sometimes you can't type stains. Yes, that's one reason. Okay. In your observations of 115, 116, and 117 when they were processed by you, did you see any signs of bacterial caused degradation? No, I don't recall seeing any bacterial degradation. The, the, the type of pattern I did see with the Bundy drops, I don't recall seeing that with those rear gate samples. Do you want to check just to yes, make I'd, sure? Yes, I'd like to review that, that yield gel just to confirm that. Yes, this is, uh, I'm looking at the results on pages 168 and 170 of my notes. I, I did not see that type of bacterial degradation pattern on those samples that I did see on the Bundy drops that we subjected to a yield gel. Okay, I assume that uh, item number 12, the cell mark RFLP result, that was obtained from inside a residence and there was no apparent presence of bacteria. Um, would that would those assumptions be consistent with the kinds of results that Cellmark obtained on that sample? Yes. Okay. Assume further that 52, the drop that was obtained from outside in the driveway at Bundy. Okay. That that's a different surface or substrate and all the ones along the walkway, 47, 48, 49, and 50. Yes, that is a different substrate. Are, are, and are you familiar with the kinds of substrates that those are, those two areas? I, I don't mind the general inquiry, but I think no foundation for this question. Uh, I'm going to overrule it because, you know, the jury has been out. They've seen the diagram. They know what the I understand. I'm just saying, as far as right. proceed. Yes, my, my familiarity is from the, the scene photographs that I have observed, and I, I noted there are some differences in the substrates. And what would those differences be? Well, particularly with the the drops that my understanding are inside the gate, inside the rear gate, that looked like a somewhat soiled or there's a lot of vegetation around that particular area, whereas 52, my understanding was that was more out by the carport, away from vegetation. What's the significance of that in terms of the observations that you made about the stains that were inside the gate along the walkway? Well, again, assuming there was less soil in that particular area, for example, or vegetation, those could be the sorts of sources for bacterial uh, growth. So if 52 was away from that type of substrate, it would most likely suffer less than the Bundy inside drops. Okay, and what about the proximity of the vegetation along the walkway versus uh, distance of the vegetation from where 52 was collected? Your Honor, uh, I think we've now ex certainly exceeded the same foundation. Sure. Have you looked at the... Uh, Council, I mean, haven't we made the point the jury's been to the crime scene, they know where the vegetation was, they know where the plant growth was, they know about bacterials, bacteria effect on the degradation process. Okay. Mr. Farlow, why don't you hang on. Um, so what effect does bacteria have, or does 
this biological material have when we're talking about bacterial caused degradation of, of blood stains? Well, again, that kind of material could provide the bacteria, for example, that would cause this degradation. Okay, Let, let's compare the surfaces along the walkway with the painted rear gate that 115, 116, and 117 were removed from. What's the significance of the different kinds of surfaces that, that pertain to these items and bacterial contamination? I think this is asked and answered. Oh, well. well, again, assuming that those surfaces are away from this type of vegetation and soil, then they would be less likely to be um, degraded in this process. What about the painted surface versus the walkway substrate surface? Well, again, uh, assuming that it's a, a fairly clean surface, then that would be less likely to have the soil or vegetation on it than, than uh, something like a walkway near a vegetation. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our uh, recess for the morning session. Please remember all of my admonitions to you. Don't discuss this case amongst yourselves. Don't form any opinions about the case. Don't conduct any deliberations until the matter has been submitted to you. Don't allow anybody to communicate with you with regard to the case. We'll stand in recess until 1 o'clock. And Mr. Sims, you may step down. You're ordered to return 1 o'clock. present. The jury is not present. Counsel, anything we need to discuss before we invite the jurors to rejoin us? Your Honor, just the, our intention to use the stereo microscope and have Mr. Sims uh, describe what he saw when he t looked at these samples of, or these socks, sometimes in the presence of Mr. Blake way back in November. So there's nothing new he's going to testify about, but I, I I'm not sure if the court has had a chance to look at it. If you want to go ahead with what we have, I, I don't have a lot more. I hate to try to predict, but less than 30 minutes. So I, I this might be the time to take it up or, or just take a break. All right. Mr. Sheck, any comment? Mrs. Robert? <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure what. Mr. Sheck. I'm not sure what Mr. Harmon is proposing. Is he, uh, in terms of the stereo microscope, is uh, obviously Mr. Sims cannot demonstrate today what he saw under the stereo microscope before he did his cuttings, because he's done his cuttings. He's testified about it. I think it's, uh, uh, I don't see how that's within the scope of uh, the redirect examination. Uh, at this point. All right, Mr. Harmon. So your objection is, is particularly one of scope. It's one of scope, and it's also um, uh, the additional one that we'd raised before with respect to uh, trying to use this witness to bolster, to, to, in effect, to redirect Mr. Yamauchi on points that uh, uh, were made with Mr. Yamauchi's cross-examination to redirect Sims regarding Yamauchi? Yes. All right. All right, Mr. Harmon? It's, it's, Mr. Sims testified on direct examination quite extensively about his examination of the socks and how difficult it was to see them. Then we saw the exciting video of those socks. Uh, Mr. Sims was cross-examined by Mr. Sheck about his examination of those socks. I mean, it seems like an, a whole lifetime ago that that happened, so I, I, 
and sometimes I try to block these things out, but um, I do recall that. Uh, what I want him to do, and I, when I think the objection is silly, and it really exalts form over substance, because at the sidebar, I commented not facetiously that that's fine. If, if we're going to exalt form over substance, uh, then I won't do it on redirect, and he'll just stay here whenever Barry's done the cross-examination, and I'll recall him on it. So we have a right to address it. I, and I, we, we have a right to address it, and I'd hope for once we won't exalt form over substance and let us address it while he's on the stand now. I, I believe it's within the scope of the redirect examination. Uh, and, and I think what you need to appreciate, Your Honor, because that's the, if that's the only objection, you either agree with me or you don't, and I, I'd just like you to know that I will call Mr. Sims whenever he is done with whatever is appropriate in this scheme of things. We do have time before Mr. Kelberg starts on Friday, so we'll be happy to do it whichever way the court chooses, but I don't believe it's beyond the scope of the cross-examination. If you'd like me to get to the substance of, of the proposed testimony, I'd be happy to do that, too. Would you make me an offer? Sure. The offer of proof is that um, Mr. Sims testified in great detail about his examination of the socks. If the court, I, the court had requested that I provide notes. It's not written up in, in the report because it's not a reportable event, as a lot of things are not in the final report. But page 117 is a sketch of the socks. And I'm sure you have as much trouble as I do reading Mr. Sims's handwriting, but you can see where he's designated stains that he did typing. And I think I need to couch this in the context of the court's previous rulings on phenolphthalein. Um, it is my understanding that the court ruled that a presumptive test, and in that context it was phenolphthalein alone, would not be a, a presumptive positive would not be allowed. And at the point when those discussions took place, we were talking about a single stain and a single spot. And we weren't talking about a blood spattered item like sock B, 13B is. We were talking about, as I recall, single items where no further testing of those items, because they were single items, existed. And I, and I think, to me, that's a, a, a major distinction, because that wasn't before the court at the time. This sock. Uh, the, the area in question that Mr. Sims, and it's the only one that we, we want the jury to look at, if you look towards the rear above the ankle of the sock there, there's a, a designation of 42B1. And Mr. Sims did these orthotolidine presumptive tests in numerous places on both sides of the socks, focusing on sock B, which is the only sock that we're interested in showing to the jury at this point, Mr. Sims tested four areas on the opposite side of the sock that's shown on 117, um, where he, he did orthotolidine and did not sample and do further testing. I just say that for background. So there's four presumptive positive areas on the flip side of the picture that you see on page 117. That's not what we want to show the jury, Your Honor, I, that, but that's background information. Um, on the side that's shown on page 117, there are three areas where Mr. Sims did the presumptive positive test, orthotolidine, and no typing was done. We only want the jury to focus on the stain that you see below 42B1. Uh, Mr. Sims represents to me that that's approximately one centimeter away from the stain that was typed. Uh, now, I know what Mr. Sheck is going to say, 
and I know what you're thinking about this, Your Honor, but rather than debate <coughs> and what is that? The previous ruling, well, this is a, this is a, this could be a different stain, or this might not be blood. And by the court's earlier ruling, you've put us in this catch-22 that the, the only time we could use a presumptive positive test result is when we have then gone on and tested that precise sample to do further confirmatory testing. And the only problem with that is, what, what, while that may be safe, um, that's the time that we could care less about a presumptive positive test because all of these tests that we do are human specific. So we've proved by the actual testing or typing results that this is human blood. I, I think the court needs to view this circumstantially and say, is there, is there some confidence that this sock, which has seven as yet untested areas that all give positive presumptive results, that also has three other areas that have been tested and, and proven to be consistent uh, with persons involved in this case, is, is, it, is there any reason to exclude this presumptive test? Because we want the jury to see that spot where he did the orthotology, because you can see it. You can see it today. They couldn't see it yesterday, but it's here. And you, they can see all the other spots, too. In other words, you're saying that once we isolate that location, you're going to have Mr. Sims testify that he did a presumptive test, got a positive, and that if you look at that same exact spot under the stereo microscope, that you'll see reddish crystalline objects consistent with being blood. Is that what you're saying? I don't mean to put words in his mouth, but words to that effect, Your Honor, yes. That's it. Let's see the microscope. This is here. Uh, Does this, excuse me, just a second. Does this need an external light source? No. My, my, uh, I don't know quite how to respond to this for a few reasons. And my suggestion is, is that if Mr. Harmon wants to put on this testimony and essentially uh, talk about new examinations and test results with respect to the SOC, the phenothalian, and the new observations by Mr. Sims that are not recorded in his notes, um, I don't know. Uh, under the circumstances whether we would object on the usual grounds that it's just a presumptive test. I don't know. And the reason I don't know is that Dr. Lee um, uh, has examined these socks, as the court knows. And uh, uh, I would want an opportunity to consult with him um, about uh, what this means in the context uh, of these socks, uh, certainly before there's cross-examination about what would be new matter. And I'm not even sure that I would necessarily object uh, to the presumptive test. I don't know until I consult with him in the overall scheme of things with respect to the SOC. But it seems to me that uh, um, this goes way beyond anything I discussed in cross-examination. Uh, it goes into the whole area of presumptive testing. And uh, I, I would take it that uh, Mr. Englert's going to testify in this case. Uh, for the prosecution, a crime scene reconstruction person who's going to be discussing the SOC and the rest of it. And all this information goes to that. So I'm not in no position to evaluate it now, and it seems to me that it's inappropriate uh, all of a sudden on the redirect examination to bring all this new matter in, new observations, new test results, some of which are presu presumptive tests, really are presumptive tests, which the court has previously made a ruling on. I can't even assess it, much less cross-examine on it. So uh, it would be my position that he should call him at another time if he wants to introduce this. And in fact, I could even make it easier because if I get an understanding, uh, and it's a little unclear to me exactly what it is, but if we can get an understanding as what it is he's observed, where he's observed it, what his test results are, and I can consult with my experts, I may not have that presumptive objection. I'm not saying that's going to be the case, but I may not. So I can't assess this. And it's unfair to raise this now on redirect. I really can't assess it. All right, Mr. Harmon, do you have the uh, item available to examine? Uh, sure, you do. Right, can, can I just respond? There's nothing new. The, the, these are ob observations that he's made. He, he examined these socks with the stereo microscope before. 
when you look at it again, I guess you could call it new, but you're looking at the old thing anew. And while he's not prepared, that sounds like a sad reflection on the fact that they don't want this to come out. And I don't blame them for not wanting it to come out, Your Honor, but it's either within the scope or it's not. And if it's not, Mr. Sims will be happy to stay here and recall him as soon as he leaves the seat. And that's not going to Re, that's not going to preclude us from the reality in those socks being shown to the jury for the first time. It shouldn't be allowed, Your Honor. And his lack of preparation, while that may be a sad commentary, I don't think it's a sincere commentary. Counsel, I, don't, I don't think you should comment on the lack of preparation about any counsel involved here. Those were his uh, I, words, I Your Honor. Well. That's assuming that this, some of this testing is new. Well, Mr. Uh, Sims, would you set up the microscope so I can look at this sock and see what's there? Need another box of large.
located the stain that we right. alluded to that's on page 117. Mr. Sheck, you want to take a look? Whatever that's worth. How much would I like to? How much adjustment of that is necessary for individuals to look at it? The main, the main knob, or is there a fine tuning? Mr. Blazier. All right, Mr. Bancroft, would you go to the seal, please? No photography, please. Sims, you might want to take a look at. Mr. Sims informs me that there is yet another stain where actual testing was done on this same sock that he'd be happy to show everybody to provide an alternative where both the orthotolidine and PCR testing were done. Okay. And then
All right, Council. Mr. Harmon. Yes, Your Honor. Um, I propose it's, a, it's the same presumptive test that was done elsewhere. It's confirmed in numerous other areas. I'd like the jury to see both of them. I realize how subtle they are, but um, that, that's either on his redirect or direct examination part two. Um, and I, I haven't heard a legal objection. I, I, Mr. Sheck and I discussed, and he, he was not aware that these are not new tests. Nothing new has been done. This is all old stuff that's in, in the lab notes that were turned over in the first report, I believe, in January. Right, so and this, the lab note that you have that you've shown to the court uh, has a date of uh, November 94. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, my confusion only was that there was mention of, uh, with Mr. Yamauchi, of other new tests being done in unnamed areas with Mr. Matheson and or Mr. Sims. I, I don't know how that relates to any of this, and maybe they can inform us. But the thing that is of interest at this point is what is being offered is something that is historic rather than new. Well, if it, th then there are two, then there, there are these issues. Number one, um, should phenothalene results, presumptive or otolidine results, presumptive tests, be permissible with respect to the testimony concerning those areas? That would be issue one issue. Another issue um, has to do with how are we going to uh, preserve uh, what we all just saw, which if we all had to describe what we just saw, I think that uh, there might be some significant differences. Mr. Harmon concedes it's subtle. Uh -huh. uh, well, Mr. Sims, is there a photo adapter for this microscope available? Uh, I have to check with LAPD on that. I, I might add Dr. Lee took pictures of these socks, uh, uh, mm -hmm. so that, what, we've never seen them. I, I saw him do that. With the stereo microscope? Uh, through a microscope, I, I stand corrected. Yes, the, the, the device that's on that photo board, Ms. Dr. Lee took photos of, of the socks. All right, well, the issue Mr. Sheck raises is a good one. How do we preserve this? How, how do we preserve any consumed sample? I, I, no, no, no. No, I, I, that's. I don't make that as a facetious question. Since the jury is gonna look at this, is there a way that we can preserve what the jury is being shown, assuming I let you do this. I was just asking, I assume that you know whether or not we can attach a photo adapter to this microscope. If, if, if that's the only condition that we can do it under, we'll... I know, I know one can, and that really is one of my points, that All before right. we go through this, um, at some point in time, uh, if we go through it, that they, there certainly should be some way to preserve the record because, uh, um, uh, particularly since other people from our side would then want to observe what this looked like at this point in time with these socks after all the subsequent handling and testing that have gone on uh, since, in particular, Dr. Lee looked at them in February. Uh, so uh, th that's my point. Uh, uh, we have a serious issue here of, uh, of making the record. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there is the presumptive point. And frankly, my cross-examination of uh, Mr. Sims on, these point, on uh, the sock examination was limited to what he could see with his naked eye. And uh, I believe his testimony was that every uh, stain he cut out for testing, he could see with his naked eye. And those were the points I made with him, and that was it. So I think that this is, uh, uh, again, go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. On this photography stuff, I don't remember us taking pictures of the glove when it came out. 
I don't remember us taking pictures of the knit cap. I'm not sure that's no, illegal. Counsel, counsel, the problem is that's real evidence that the jury gets to look at, correct? But this is something that they will not be able to look at in the jury room in this form. Well, they could. We could give, we could, they could do that. Not easily. I think it would be interesting, were I the finder of fact, to be able to preserve what it is that I see there. Now, what I see there is an ultra-fine weave. appears to be a synthetic material because of its shininess, obviously not cotton. Um, there appear to be these little reddish spherical items interspersed within these small weavings, and they appear to be dispersed over an area to the top of what I saw there, not in the center. It would be nice if we could preserve that. I just asked, can we do that? That's not a condition. We're working on that, Your Honor. That's what we're doing right now, Your Honor. We're checking. At a minimum, what we could do at this moment. But I have to say, since we found out that LAPD doesn't have video cameras, they may not have photo adapters. Maybe someone will donate them when they hear that, Your Honor. What I was going to suggest at a minimum, Your Honor, to save time, is that what we could do is take a photograph of the position of the sock under the microscope to preserve the positioning so that um, it could be repositioned again when we have the photo adapter, mm -hmm. and then take the photograph that would preserve the view, um, so that we wouldn't waste any time. All right. And we could do that at this moment. All right. The other issue is whether or not I should allow testimony regarding the uh, uh, presumptive testing on the the uh, sock. All right. Two issues: Can the prosecution present a view of the sock to the jury at this time on redirect examination of Mr. Sims? Uh, clearly, the issue presented to the jury, one of the issues is whether or not blood could be seen on the sock at the time that it was examined. First of all, at the time that it was picked up on June the uh, 13th, also at the time that Mr. Matheson, Mr. Yamauchi, and Ms. Kessler uh, did their inventory on June the 29th, the issue then being how the blood may or may not have been deposited on that sock. So clearly, the issue is before the jury. What you can and can't see on a dark colored sock is clearly an issue before the jury. So this testimony has been gone into, excuse me, this questioning has been gone into by both sides with Mr. Sims, so I find it an appropriate questioning within the scope of the uh, redirect examination. So I'll allow the microscopic uh, examination. Next question is whether or not the court should allow the results of presumptive testing uh, with regards to the sock, I don't think that that lends anything to the finder of fact here because the issue is can you see blood on it, not whether or not the presumptive testing was done. So what I'll allow is the exhibition of both spots on the sock that you've just shown to the court and we'll forego any testimony regarding presumptive testing at this time. All right, that's the court's ruling. If there is other testing going on of conventional or DNA quality... Why don't you let Mr. Harmon address this? Your Honor, I, I believe on the second area that we showed, there, we have complied with the court's All right, earlier if the rule. Second, if the second area is a place that was tested presumptively and then tested with a confirmation test, which the PCR test I assume is, then I'll allow that. That's, that's the court's ruling that I made two months ago. All right. Your Honor, but my, my concern remains about um, I would insist, frankly, since I know it's possible whether they have the equipment or not is another issue, I would insist that we have a contemporaneous record through a photograph of exactly, through this enhanced view, mm -hmm. what everybody saw and when they saw it. And that's particularly important. If defense experts are going to get on the stand and comment on what the jury has already seen, how can they do it without a record, particularly if the socks are been put back in the bag and handled again, without question, the, uh, right. those areas will change. Ms. Martinez? Uh, Mr. Matheson, Mr. Kessler, I'm available at the moment, and um, Mr. Yamaguchi, they're trying to contact Mr. Yamaguchi. Uh, you know, I, I just contribute that these stains are still here in spite of Dr. Lee rolling them inside out. That was pretty rough treatment. He gave them well, back Mr. Harmon, February. Well, Mr. Harmon, that's not the issue. The issue is can so we preserve this sure. so that their experts can take a look at it? If it's possible, I'd like to do that. 
Sure, and we'd have, be happy to. I was just responding to that. Okay, all right, it's not necessary. Mr. Fairlow, let's see if you can, how, how close to find view through the viewer you can get. Right, there, there are, if this is any assistance, there are devices which attach to these microscopes. I know, I have, one at, I have one at home, if I had known. <laughs> I would have brought it with me. And, and there, there are problems here in terms of being able to get the stereo view. I understand. And if it helps, it was my recollection that we had asked at one point whether they had such devices available at the LAPD. In fact, I think the court recalls this discussion. And I... I recall we had this discussion because some Dr. Lee or somebody had to rent a microscope we, for one yes, of our, and my, our, I recollect that. So my recollection is, is that, uh, and I don't hold me to it, is that we may be in a futile search at LAPD to get the device that's necessary to create this documentation. Well, what we may have to do is draw a pencil outline of that sock and the way it is, and I'll have to have the bailiff sit here all night and guard the sock till we get a microscope. Any chance that will focus through the eyepiece? No, Your Honor. Okay. <coughs> well, I'll tell you what. Let's uh, proceed with the testimony, and we'll... Uh, Oh, I understand that. I understand that. But I, I'm just trying to do this as easily as possible. But my proposal is that we go for it. Mr. <coughs> Sims was able to locate these places on the basis of his notes. I feel confident in his ability to do that. My concern is the concern that Mr. Sheck raises, because obviously these are things that can eventually break off or, or powder off. And I just like to get it as close to what it, we have now that the jury is going to see. Does that make sense? So, I guess they're working on it now, Your Honor. But I, I, do, I do have comments, actually, that if they survive, if this particular stain has survived this long, it's not going anywhere. Well, I'm glad you're confident about that, but I'm, I'm just a little more cautious. If we can get it photographed this afternoon, that's what I'd like to do. Um, Mr. Sims informs me, if we wait a few minutes, he, he believes he has a microphotograph of that B2 stain before the sampling was done. And we're trying to locate that right now. If that's what they have, then that's what they ought to use, because that's the best evidence. No, I think maybe the jury can see it. I'm just concerned in compare, if we can compare the photograph with what we can see here. But my inclination right now, Mr. Harmon, which one of these stains do you want to proceed with? Uh, because what we'll have to do is have the jury cycle through, and I'm going to encourage them to take as much time as they want. So pick, sure. pick the one you want to show first. Um, the, the one without the cutout, which is below B1. All right. Mr. Sims, would you position that for us, please, right now? So he'll position the microscope, all right? The jury will come down. They'll take a look. We'll then put a guard here. Uh, how am no, I going to? No, I'm being facetious, counsel. Right. <laughs> I'm sure we can find a photo adapter for a microscope between now and 5 o'clock. Well, that, that, no, but that, then, then, then let me go on. This will end at some point, and I'll be able to get up and ask Mr. Sims some questions. Uh -huh 
uh, we're going to have to leave it there like that. No. I think Mr. Sims was able to locate the first sock, excuse me, first spot on the sock by referring to his notes and other landmarks that are on the, uh, the sock. I mean, there is a regular pattern to the sock, and there's regular decor decorative interweavings right. in the sock. He can locate those items and refocus for us. And we won't roll them up, we'll just fold them and put them back into the bag today. And Mrs. Robertson will keep custody of them if we can't accomplish that by five today. No, I, I note your objection. All right. All right, Deputy Magnera, let's have the jury, please. with this right now, I can do it. Okay. When the jury comes by, that the council table be cleared of all notes and papers. Yes, yeah, that's not a bad idea. All right, let the record reflect. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let the record reflect that uh, all of our jury members have again joined us. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My apologies to you for the uh, longer than normal lunch hour back there. I had some evidentiary issues that I had to uh, rule upon before some items are shown to you, and we had to set some of the physical evidence up uh, to show you. All right, Mr. Uh, Gary Sims is again on the witness stand undergoing redirect examination by Mr. Harmon. Uh, good afternoon again, Mr. Sims. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Mr. Sims, you were, sir, are reminded you were still under oath, and Mr. Harmon, you may continue with your redirect examination. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to have marked as People's 287 for identification the chart that we made up over the lunchtime. Yes. Re reflect, I've given a copy to counsel. Um, what I'd like to do is just to, to recap with, with the chart that you helped prepare with us over the week or over the lunch hour. Okay. Okay. What I want to do is just kind of discuss the, the your numbers real, real quickly in the groups from which these stains were collected, namely 47, 48, 49, and 50. Okay. Okay. Um, could you tell us what your figures were for 47? For 47, it was 0 0.9 nanograms DNA per one milligram swatch.
So 47 is 0.9. Yes. We have 48. That is 0 0.6. And 49. 0 0.1. And 50. 0 0.53. And in parentheses, you have slot plot there. That's the method that you use to estimate the amount of DNA? Yes, that was the determination of the total amount of human DNA. And if you'd look, if you'd look at the monitor, I just want you to look at the bat, the area that these were collected from. That's forty-seven. Okay. Forty-eight. Okay. Forty-nine. Okay. Fifty. Okay. Okay. And substrate looks comparable in, the, in those four. Yes. Okay, and then 52, what sort of estimation did you come up with with 52, the one from out in the driveway? That was 2.4 by the slot plot also. Okay, that reflects your quantification from 287? Yes. By, by the slot plot method again? Yes. Okay. That looks like a, a different kind of surface? Yes, I would say that that appears to be a different surface than the earlier ones. Okay, and then with respect to, to six, what was your quantification of uh, item six from the Rockingham address? That was 6.7. And what met, how did you estimate that? Well, that was based on the high molecular weight uh, from a yield gel blot where we actually tested the DNA for human content. What's the correlation between uh, uh, estimating it in the way you did number six versus 47, 48, 49, and 50? Well, with those, some of those other samples that w in that Bundy series, some of those were subjected to just the yield gel analysis, and we could see this degradation pattern uh, that appeared to be from uh, bacterial contamination. Six looks like a different surface. Yes, that that driveway looks different. Okay, let's move to. Um, I've asked you to assume hypothetically the twelve was on an indoor floor, and we're looking for that photograph now. But let's shift to one fifteen, one sixteen, and one seventeen. Okay, oh, and what oh. are your estimations on the amount of DNA in those three samples? Number one fifteen was. 13.5, number 116 was 13.6, and number 117 was 27.
Mr. Sims, does that look like the one of the photos that you've seen were for 115, 116, 117? Yes, I believe I've seen a, that photo or a similar photo before. Okay. And let's show you a close-up of that. Does that look like one of the other photos you've seen? Yes. Uh, I think the record looks like these are July 3rd photos. Yes. What board is this from? Exhibit 53, Your Honor. All right. On to 53D, then. It's a photograph of 116. E. 53E. It's a photograph of 117 from outside. 53F. It's a close up photograph of 117. Have you seen those photographs before? Yes, I have. Perspective of the, the walkway, which includes numbered stains that uh, Mr. Sims has seen individual photos of. Do you recognize that, Mr. Sims? Uh, I think this is the first time I've seen this perspective photograph. I, I, at this point, I think it's the jury's seen it. It's foundational at this point to ask him to comment Redundant. on photographs he hasn't even Redundant. seen. Redundant, 352. 352 and foundational objection at this point. All right, let's move on. Okay. Mr. Sims, I, I want you to assume now, we've talked about, you've seen the areas that these things were collected from, you've commented on the differences in substrates. I want you to assume that items 115, 116, and 117 were collected on July 3rd, 1994, okay? Okay. Um, and, and they were, that a criminalist was specifically directed to collect those stains, okay? Okay. That those stains were collected in the same fashion as the stains were collected on June 13th at Bundy, okay? Okay. They were taken directly to the lab to dry. Okay. That they were in object to any more questions along this line because there's uh, on foundational grounds with respect to the absence of testimony. Right, that's premature then. Proceed. That they were in the, pla the plastic bags which the other items which were collected on June 13th were, were originally placed in for a shorter period of time. No foundation. Okay. Okay. Um, now you've talked about bacteria getting in there and chewing up the human DNA. Um, if there was no bacteria on the gate, as opposed to the bacteria that you saw at the Bundy crime scene. Objection to this form of this foundationally in terms of this hypothetical. Oh. I, I'll, I'll withdraw that. The, you saw no signs of bacterial contamination or degradation in 115, 116, 117. Right? That's correct. I didn't see that pattern that we did see in some of the other Bundy, in some of the Bundy drops. Okay. It, is it surprising that you see the amount of human DNA that you do in 115, 116, and 117, given the assumptions I've just asked you to make? Well. Objection to the form of that question calls for speculation. Is there, any, the question. is there anything remarkable about the amounts of DNA that you see in 115, 116, and 117, given that you don't see any bacterial caused degradation? Same objection. Sustain. Phrase the question. You didn't see any bacteria in 115, 116, and 117. I, I saw no evidence of that bacterial degradation pattern, no. Okay, and what is the significance of that? not seeing any bacterial degradation 
in, in light of the amount of DNA that you saw. Objection to the form of that question. Well, the, the significance that I see in this is that there's no evidence of the kind of massive bacterial contamination of, of these samples that was seen in some of the other Bundy samples. So in other words, I don't see the evidence of that. So it's not surprising to me that we recovered a good amount of DNA out of these samples to work with. And, and if 115, 116, and 117 were in fact there on June 13th and there was no bacterial induced degradation, would you expect to see what you saw when you analyzed those samples? Yes, that's a reasonable expectation. You have reviewed Mr. Matheson's notes and the conventional serological testing that he performed on 115, 116, and 117, have you not? Yes, I've, I've seen that run sheet. Okay. Are the conventional serology results obtained by Mr. Matheson with respect to 115, 116, and 117 similar? To each other, yes, they are. When I say similar, I mean to each other within the three samples. Yes. And what markers did Mr. Matheson uh, test those three samples for? He tested for EAP and also PGM. Now, we've heard a lot about EAP, and I'm not, I don't intend to go into that uh, with you. But what form of test did Mr. Matheson use for PGM, the marker PGM? Uh, I I'm sorry, a little more, could you give me a little more information? Sure. Do you know what kind of test he performed for the PGM marker in those three stains? Yes, this was protein electrophoresis. And did he perform PGM subtyping? Yes, it was actually a PGM subtyping uh, system. Okay. In your years of uh, doing conventional serology, both for prosecutors and defendants, is that a marker that you've tested frequently? Yes, very often. And did you keep abreast, and do you keep abreast of the scientific literature about the PGM marker? Yes. What can you tell us about the term persist, or strike that, can you, is the term persistence of some technical significance in this area? Yes, that's, that's a term that's used to describe the, how long a period of time and what kind of conditions a sample, such as blood, could be exposed to, and you could still get a typable result. And could you tell us what, it, what you are aware of from the scientific literature about the persistence of the PGM marker based on the scientific literature? Yes, it's, it's a, as far as enzymes are concerned, we would consider it a fairly stable marker. Uh, in, in typical laboratory studies, um, laboratory prepared blood stains, it might persist for something like a month, two months, three months, something like that. Now this is at room temperature. And th those are, you said, laboratory-prepared stains? Yes. Could you tell us what that means? Well, what that generally means is that somebody takes a fresh blood sample, puts it on something like a clean cotton uh, swatch material, and then just lets it sit at, at ambient conditions, and usually indoors. And what's the range on this, that the studies have shown that the PGM marker persists under those conditions? Well, it... Again, it would go from something like about a month out to uh, maybe several months, something like that. There's, it's, it's a fairly broad range. Um, what can you tell us about, you've told us that the results are, are comparable for all three stains, is that right? Yes, the, the results as reported by Mr. Matheson were all comparable. And when you say comparable, can you tell us what results were obtained? Well, for all of the PGM samples, no activity was observed. What does that mean? That means that you don't see any of these bands on the gel. You look in the lane where that sample was run and you don't see any of the bands. Does that mean that the marker did not persist in the way you described it a little bit ago? Yes, it's gone off or lost its activity. And again, that assumes that the test was performed correctly and the standards give the proper results, and they appear to in this case. What sorts of things have an impact on this losing the activity for the PGM marker? Well, again, sometimes with proteins, a lot of different biochemical reactions can take place. Uh, such that it'll be degraded, 
uh, to a point where it may just lose its activity altogether. Or what usually happens is with, especially with PGM, it goes through a series of re reactions until it gets weaker and weaker, and then it's just no longer detectable. What's the impact of just time alone on a, on a stain that's been allowed to dry? Well, with time, any stain would and not unpreserved, in other words, left in the environment, the ambient environment, it'll get to the point where it's no longer typable. What about sunlight? Yes, yeah, sunlight could have an effect on something like that. Or what kind of effect? Well, again, it would no longer be, be typable. And the PG or the EAP results that Mr. Uh, Matheson obtained on those three samples, 115, 116, and 117, what were they? Again, no activity was detected. Uh, do these comparable results that were produced for all three of the stains, do they support those stains being on the same substrate in the same environment for a comparable period of time? Yes, I mean, again, within broad limits, but yes, they're all, they all look the same as far as the PGM results. And if testimony is shown that 115, item 115 was on that gate on June 13th, are the comparable results that you've just described consistent with the other two stains having been on the gate on June 13th? No, no, no. Objection to the foundation of that hypothetical sustain. Is there anything about your review of Mr. Matheson's uh, testing and your review of all of the data in testing for 115, 116, and 117 support the conclusion that those three stains were on that gate on June 13th? Objection to the form of that question. Sustained. Is there anything in your review of Mr. Matheson's testing and your actual testing on 115, 116, and 117, which is inconsistent with those three stains being on the rear gate on June 13th. Objection. Sustained. What, if anything, is there in your reports which may be construed as undermining the fact that those three stains, 115, 116, and 117, were on the rear gate on June 13th, 1994? Objection. Sustained. Mr. Uh, Harmon, the, the problem I'm having is the assumption of June the 13th. There's some comparability as far as age or activity that you can draw from those conclusions. I'll allow that. That's the, what the, I was the attempting. The problem is the assumption about the age, the, the specific date is the assumption that I'm having problems with. Is there anything about your observations, the testing of those three stains that your lab did as well as your review of Mr. Matheson's test results, which is inconsistent with those stains being on the gate for the same period of time. I, I found nothing inconsistent. And same question, but let's make that same period of time begin June 13th. Objection to that. Foundation. Mr. Sims, is there anything in your, that you've seen in your review of Mr. Matheson's test results on, June, on 115, 116, and 117, combined with the actual testing and review of those three stains yourself, which is inconsistent with those stains being on that gate for a period of two to three weeks? Hold. I found nothing inconsistent with that. Mr. Sims, it's time that we finish and talk about the socks, okay? Okay. You don't have any idea when the stains you tested on those socks were deposited there, do you? That's correct. You know from the test results that there were many stains, is that true? Yes. You know from your test results they were from more than one person? Sustained. Do you know from your test results that they were from more than one person? Still leading. Oh. Yes. Do your test results uh, 
include Nicole Brown and Mr. Simpson as possible sources on SOC A? That's correct. Do your test results include Nicole Brown from among the three reference samples as a possible source on SOC B? That's correct. You previously described numerous microscopic stains between, on SOC B between the two stains that you typed as being consistent with the cold brown. Is that correct? Yes, within that area of the SOC, yes. And those about a dozen? Something like that, yes. And you previously described that there was no apparent blood which soaked through from 13A1 to the opposite side of that sock? Your Honor, I just stand up bleeding. I want to get on with this. It's all bleeding. Was there any apparent blood which soaked through to the opposite side of the major stain that you tested from Greg Matheson's cutout at 13A1? Oh. Well, again, when I laid that sock out and looked at it, I didn't see any evidence for that. In your opinion, you strike that. You've looked, and we're going to look at this at the socks through the microscope. But how many hours did you scan these socks using the microscope for? It, it would it would be very difficult for me to estimate that, but uh, many hours. I would say many hours looking through the microscope and then also looking at them macroscopically. Having spent many hours looking at the, at the various stains and keeping in light the results that you've produced, your typing results, when the blood which you've typed as being consistent with Nicole Brown appears dry, okay? Okay. Is it just as difficult to see as the blood that you've typed consistent with Mr. Simpson's blood? Objection to the, that hypothetical. You've produced two, two different sets of typing results on these socks, is that correct? Yes. Some you've typed consistent with Mr. Simpson? Yes. Some you've typed consistent with Nicole Brown? Yes. Having spent those many hours looking at those stains, do the stains that type consistent with Nicole Brown, do they look any differently than the stains that you type consistent with Mr. Simpson? Objection to, to foundation, and it's vague as to what stains, what place. I, I didn't note any difference, no. So of the two different typing results that you produced, were they equally difficult to visualize? Seems facts not in evidence in terms of what's visualized as stain. Is there any scientific reason to believe that Mr. Simpson's blood is more difficult to see than Nicole's blood on those socks? Rephrase the question. Are you aware of any scientific principle which would explain why Mr. Simpson's blood might be more difficult to see than Nicole Brown's blood when you look at those socks? Same, same objection. It's the same. Are you aware of any scientific literature that says one person's blood is more difficult to see on a pair of black socks than another person's? Objection. Oh. No, I'm not aware of any such literature. Mr. Sims, let's talk about the socks and specifically sock B at this point. Um, okay. In the many hours that you looked at sock B, you, pre you performed several samplings of sock B, is that correct? Yes. How many different cuttings did you make of SOC B, which led to typing results? There were two stains cut out on B that led to typing results. And those were stains which typed consistent with Nicole Brown? Yes. Those were 42B1, or your number 42B1? Yes. This is from SOC 13B, and your number 42B2? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to direct you. Do you have your sketch in front of you? Yes, I do. And have you set up SOC B here on an area that's, that was of interest to you that you noted when you examined these socks on November 11, 1994? Yes. And 
without going to, into any processing about that specific stain, would you tell us how you located it without talking about any testing um, and what you were able to see back in November? Well, I, I was examining it under the stereo microscope and I was documenting where the reddish stains were. And, and how many reddish stains did you document just on the side that we're looking at that's <coughs> reflected on page 117 in your notes? Well, again, it was, it was about a dozen. I, I haven't counted them again, but it's, it's in that area of a dozen. These are in addition to the two stains that you've described as having type B1 and B2? Yes, I believe that's correct. And then at some point did you flip the sock over and, and visualize other reddish areas on the other sock? Well, on, on the other side of that sock, I'm, yes. I'm sorry, the other side. Yes. Your Honor, may I have the, this sketch mar uh, projected or marked as 288 and projected on the Elmo? All right, people's 288. And how about a foundational question or two about the date that this was prepared? Mr. Sims, what date did you do this work that's reflected on page 117? The, the actual sketch was made on November 11th of 1994. And then I went, and it says in the middle of the page, I went back and noted some additional stains on November 21st of 1994. Okay, may I put that on the Elmo, Your Honor? What I'd like to do, uh, Mr. Sims, I think we've covered both sides of the sock now. You saw four on the opposite side of the sock, two stains that you typed, and then 12 other little areas on, on, the, on the side that's on 288, the sketch, right? Yes, about 12. Okay, and you have already set up the stereo microscope on one of those areas, is that correct? Yes, I have. Okay, could we have that up there? And could you help uh, Jonathan? We want to put an arrow to the, that points out the area on the sock that uh, the stereo microscope is focused on at this point. Okay, where... Okay, well, Mr. Sims, can you step down and, and help direct Jonathan to this? Is that arrow in the correct place? Yes. Okay. And now, go ahead. You can have a seat again. Could we capture that, Your Honor? Please. Please. Thank you. That'd be 288A? Uh, yes, 288A. Okay. Now, Mr. Sims, you've looked at the sock this morning under the stereo microscope that's before me on the council table, have you not? Yes, I have. Uh, before you looked at the, or strike that, is what that arrow is pointing to, is that visible to the naked eye? It's, it's only visible to the naked eye under special, if you illuminate it strongly and look, get the proper illumination, you can sort of see the, the discoloration. Okay, and you reviewed this sock B this morning to, to locate the area on 288A that we just showed on your sketch there? Yes. It, does it look the same as it did when you looked at it back in November of, of 94? I, I don't notice any difference. It, it appears to be similar. Your, your Honor, at this point... Mr. Sims, what do you see at this location? At, at this particular location, 
I see some reddish staining. It's, it's almost like a fine powder that's over the, uh, the, the black fibers that are present. And you can see that it, under the microscope, you can see well the difference between the reddish area of the stain against the background. And have you seen that reddish staining in other areas, for example, in an area 42B2 that we'll have the jury look at later on? Yes, it's a, it's a similar type of staining on this particular item throughout. Does it look like blood? Yes, it, it looks like blood. Suggestion okay. that if we're going to, we, we, we have a, a plan here. <laughs> but I would request that uh, maybe we do, we elicit the foundation as to both places for observation and just do a seriatim. Uh, yeah, but we're going to take a break in between. Okay. So, all right. Let's start with juror number 1492. We'll start at the end of the queue this time. Let's have 1492 come forward, take a look. And uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, we'll just bring you up here one, one at a time to look through the stereo microscope. Take your time. Don't feel rushed. Up so that we can uh, come on up. Thank you. Have any difficulty seeing this, uh, Mr. Sims? Can you fine adjust that? Why don't you step down in case any of the witnesses, excuse me, any of the jurors need assistance in seeing that?
that all of our jurors and alternates have had the opportunity to view this particular portion uh, of this particular sock. And Mr. Harmon, you wanted to display one other location. Yes, Your Honor. The logistics, could, could we approach it? Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a uh, recess for about uh, 20 minutes just so we can change the uh, uh, location that the uh, microscope looks at. So please remember my admonitions to you, and we'll bring you out as soon as we have that reposition for you to look at. All right? All right, we'll take about 20 minutes. And